want you to think about the last party you attended. Not that kind of party, okay? I'm talking birthday party, graduation party, anniversary party, a promotion party, somebody became vice president, uh, or won, you know, uh, like, like most sales. Maybe it was somebody graduated boot camp or, you know, completed BUDS training and became a Navy SEAL. You see, as human beings, it is in our very nature to celebrate important milestones and achievements. This is why we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and graduations and promotions. It's to remember something. It's to celebrate something that someone accomplished. And and at any good party, there's always kind of three elements that are part of it. The first one is community. We gather with people we love, with people that get an invite. Um, (laughs) We gather with teammates, coworkers, right? Like, like, like there's, it's not celebrating by ourselves. It's done in the context of community. Uh, the second element is that we actually usually reflect. If it's a more formal celebration, uh, you know, a retirement ceremony or a graduation, right? There's actually formal speeches where pe- people actually talk about the past and what was and what was accomplished and look forward to what will be. And so there's community, there's reflection. And the third thing that's always there is celebration. Meaning there's usually, you know, great food after or during and drink and, you know, dancing and maybe gifts. And I bring this up because Jesus gave us two very important celebrations for our Christian life. That if we're going to follow Jesus, Jesus gave us these two things that we are supposed to do that help us remember who he is, what he has done, and ultimately who we are in him. And those two things are baptism and communion. And those are the two ways of Jesus that we're going to talk about today. The two ways of Jesus where Jesus says, hey, if you're going to follow me, here's what I want you to do. He says with communion, I want you to remember me. And with baptism, he says, hey, I want you to be baptized. And so here's how it's going to work today. We're going to talk about those two things, and then we're actually going to practice those two things. The first part of the message, we are going to talk about communion. And maybe you, you, you kind of know what communion is, or, or maybe you're, you're not sure and you think, well, I know there's churches that do communion different. I want to give you a clear picture today of why communion for the Jesus followers is a really big deal. And then kind of right in the middle of the message, we're going to practice and we're going to receive communion as part of our worship. But then we're not done yet. Then we're going to talk about baptism. And then we're actually going to practice it. We have several of you that showed up today pre-registered planning to be baptized in water, to show on the outside what Christ has done for you on the inside. We're going to talk about what water baptism is, why it's important for the Jesus follower. Um, and then we're actually going to watch and worship people, uh, watch, and, watch and worship as people get baptized as we end the service. So that's the game plan today. Let's jump right in and let's start by talking about communion. If you're taking notes today, here's the first thing I want you to understand about communion. Communion, think of it as an ongoing celebration. Communion is something we're supposed to do again and again and again. It's kind of like a birthday or an anniversary. It's not something you do just once. It's something you celebrate ongoing and often. And the command of communion comes straight from Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. Here's what it says. The teaching I gave you is the same that I received from the Lord. On the night when the Lord Jesus was handed over to be killed, he took bread and gave thanks for it. Then he divided the bread and said, this is my body, it is for you. Eat this to, everybody say the next two words out loud. Remember me. In the same way, after the, after the eight, Jesus took a cup of wine. He said this cup represents the new agreement from God, which begins with my blood sacrifice. When you drink this, do it to remember me. This means that every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are telling others about the Lord's death until he comes again. And before you eat the bread and drink the cup, you should examine your own attitude. So from this one passage, I want to show you three things that the celebration of communion invites me to do. 
Every time that we come to communion, or maybe uh, as you learned it in your church tradition, was the Lord's table or the Eucharist. Every time we come to the Lord's table, it invites me to do three things. I want to give them to you. Here they are, real quick. The first one is it invites me to look back. Everybody say, look back. Um, I, I love history. Um, to my children's, um, you know, uh, what would be the right word? Uh, to my children's annoyance, I love history, okay? Because I watch things that they don't like watching. How many of you are with me? Uh, I watch documentaries. I love documentaries about, you know, different wars and civil war in our country and World War I. And, like, if dad has the remote, it's either sports or history, um, and, and so, uh, you know, but I come by it naturally because when I was a kid, my dad loved history. Um, and there were times that I was like, really, dad? Uh, one of those specifically was I was 10 years old. My younger sister was eight. So 10 and eight year old. We planned a family vacation to the East Coast. We were going to see all the sites, do all the things, New York City, Philadelphia, you know, go to the beach. But in the middle of this, like, family vacation, my dad planned a whole day for us at Gettysburg. Thrilling for a 10 and 8-year-old, as you can imagine, right? Like, where we spent a day looking at history of the Civil War. I was like, we could be at roller coaster. Or we can be walking a field, you know, where like the most Americans died. Um, history is important. Why? Because it tells us our history. It tells us our story. It tells us where we've been, the cost of our decisions, and the will needed to win a war. Do you know communion invites us to look back at our story, at our history, at communion, we're invited to look back at where we've been, the cost of our decisions, and God's will to win the war for our salvation. You see, when we hold the bread, when we eat the bread, it reminds us of the body of Jesus that was beaten and broken and nailed to a cross because of our sin, not somebody else's. That it's our sin, that it's our rebellion, that it's our waywardness that is the reason Christ went to the cross. Scripture tells us that he carried our sin. He took our sin upon himself on the cross. That he was the perfect sacrifice once and for all, for all sin. And in the cup, we see the blood of Jesus. That it covers our sin. That, that, that the blood of Christ creates this new covenant, this new agreement between God and humanity. That we are forgiven from the curse of sin and death. You remember a couple weeks ago where we looked at that scripture in Romans that said because of our ancestor Adam, we all inherited that legacy of sin and death. Remember that? But from Christ, we have the opportunity to inherit a new legacy of forgiveness and new life. That's what we remember at the cup. And so every time we eat the bread and we drink the cup, it's something we can taste and touch and experience that tells us a story that causes us to look back at what Christ did for us. And so at communion, it is an opportunity, it's an invitation for me to look back, and simultaneously, it's an invitation, if you're taking notes, write this down, for me to look ahead. Everybody say, look ahead. So I look back and I look ahead. Um, I want you to think about the feeling you have like a week before you're going on a great vacation. Right? Like, I mean, think about your favorite vacation, like in this spot. About a week before it, what do you feel? Or let's say, let me give you another example. You're a student, and it's like one week before the end of the semester. You're getting ready to go on summer break, or you're a teacher, and you're like, thank God, summer break's coming, right? Like, like think about what do you feel when you know something good is just a little ways away? What do you feel? You feel anticipation, you feel excitement, even if you have finals ahead, and you're like, oh, I gotta work hard, I gotta, but, but there's hope. Why? Because something better is coming. When we come to communion, yes, we look back at what Jesus did, but we should be filled with hope because something better is coming. Did you catch it in verse 26? What was written in 1 Corinthians 11? It said, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he what? comes again. 
So at communion, we don't just remember what Jesus has done. We remember what Jesus will do. What will he do? In the same way he fulfilled his promise to become the sacrifice for our sin, which restores and redeems us back into relationship with God, we have a promise that is yet to be fulfilled. But because we know the first promise was fulfilled, we know the next one will too. And that is that Jesus will come again. And when he comes again, he will redeem and restore all things. All the brokenness that's in our world. And so at communion, we do two things. We look back and say, wow, Jesus, thank you for what you have done. But we look ahead with anticipation, with excitement, with hope. Knowing something better is coming. A day when heaven and earth will be reunited as one. And we will live for all eternity with our Lord. And so we look back, we look ahead, and then here's the third thing communion invites me to do. If you're taking notes, write this down. We look within. Everybody say, look within. We look within. Um, Do you know who the easiest person to lie to is? yourself right if you're a teenager you were like my parents um we have a youth group for that we're working on it okay you should go thursday nights um yeah no the easiest person to lie to it is yourself it's easy for me to justify my behavior it's easy for me to inflate my own perception of myself it's easy for me to ignore my problems and point out yours and my guess is you're not that different than me It's so easy to justify my behavior, to inflate my own perception of myself, to ignore my own problems and make sure I point out yours. And my guess is you're not that different than me. This is why part of communion says that we are to examine ourselves, that we are supposed to look within, right? Remember we said last week that the Holy Spirit, God's presence at work in our life, is like the Mandalorian. The Holy Spirit is the one that tells us this is the way. Or sometimes, this is not the way. Right? This is not the way. Holding on to that bitterness. Holding on to that hurt. This is not the way. Scripture takes this really seriously. That's why if you actually read the rest, all of that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I left out a few verses just for time's sake. But one of them around communion says that we need to look within because it actually says this. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner, actually eats and drinks condemnation on themselves. Oof. Now, some churches use that to, like, scare you when it comes to communion. And maybe you grew up in a church that was kind of like that, right? Maybe maybe you grew up in a church that, I grew up in a church a little bit where, you know, uh, they would preach, you know, the hellfire and brimstone, and and they didn't want you to go to hell, so they would just scare the hell out of you. Anybody? (laughs) Grew up in a church like that, right? And maybe you grew up where communion was this thing. You were like, oh, I don't feel qualified. I don't feel like I should should take that. And that verse telling you that anybody who drinks or eats in an unworthy manner, it's not meant to keep you from communion. What it's meant to do is to help you come to communion sober-minded about yourself. It's meant to help you come to communion and go, let me not let myself off the hook for my behavior. Let me not overinflate my perception of self. Let me stop looking at others out there and saying the problem is with them and take a moment with Jesus and say, Jesus, is there any problem in here? Is there anything that I need to settle, that I need to own up to? And you know what scripture actually says? That if we realize there's something we need to own up to between us and somebody else, Like, Scripture takes this idea of communion and examining ourselves so seriously that it says if if right before you're receiving communion, you realize, whoo, you know what? There's something between me and another brother or sister in Christ. It says, actually, you should leave right then. And you should go to that person, and you should fix it, and you should ask for forgiveness, and you should restore the relationship. Then come back and receive communion. So some of you, you need to leave right now, and then I'll be waiting for you in about an hour, okay, when you... Come back. We'll have communion for you at the next service. Now, again, it's not to keep us from communion. It's to keep us closer to God. To say, God, show me anything in my life that would be between me and you. 
It's really the heart of what King David wrote in Psalm 139. Look at this. He wrote this. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Here's what we're going to do. You guys can go ahead and bring that down for just a second. We're going to put that scripture back up. Uh, we're going to receive communion right now. All right, right here in the message. I want us to have an opportunity to look within, to look ahead and look back. And so if you receive these elements when you walked in, go ahead and grab them. Uh, if you did not, I'm going to invite our ushers to walk all the way down to the front. Then they'll turn around. If you miss communion, wave your hand. They'll make sure that you get served. If you're at home, grab some crackers, some juice, some bread, some wine. Get ready to join us. We practice open communion. Let me tell you what that means. You do not have to be a member. You do not have gone to a series of classes. You don't need to have gone to catechism or anything like that. If you want to celebrate with us what Christ did for you, you are welcome to receive communion. We believe it's the Lord's table. And everybody's welcome at his table. Everybody's invited into his party, okay? So just hold those elements for a second, and I'm going to lead us. Again, ushers are coming around. If you need communion, wave at them, make sure everybody gets it. Okay. Once you have that in your hand, would you stand with me? We're going to join our Catholic brothers and sisters today and get up and get down and get up and get down, okay? Uh, fight, fight, fight. Um, here we go. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to give us a moment to practice what was just preached. I want to let you look within and maybe pray that prayer that we just put up on the screen. And we're going to put it back up there in just a second. Maybe for you, you want to look ahead. Maybe there's somebody you love that you know is uh, coming to the end of life in this body. But if they're in Christ, it's just a transition. And so maybe you want to be filled with hope today and gratitude, saying, Lord, I thank you that we have this great hope of your return and a renewal where heaven and earth are one. Man, what a, what, what a, what a beautiful thing. Maybe today you just want to look back and say, Jesus, thank you that you love me so much. That your body was nailed to a cross, that your blood was poured out, becoming the perfect sacrifice, covering my sin. All right, so go ahead and put that scripture back up. And I just want to give us a few moments, and maybe you just want to read that, you want to pray that, look within, look ahead, and look back, and then I'll lead us in receiving communion together. Let's take a moment of personal prayer and reflection. All right, if you would, just go ahead and open that first little plastic layer and get the bread in your hand. At that first communion, Christ took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Let's remember and worship Jesus as we eat together. And then if you'll open the cup, Christ took a cup of wine. He said, this is the new agreement, the new covenant, the new promise, his blood poured out, covering all sin for all time. Let's drink the cup, remember, and worship Jesus together. Let me just say a quick prayer, and then uh, we'll be seated. Uh, Lord, thank you that you give us something tangible to taste, to touch, that reminds us of you, your body and your blood given for us so that we can be forgiven and made new. We say thank you. We worship and celebrate you today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Hey, you can be seated real quick. Some of you, I know it feels like we should be done. We're not. That was act one. We still got act two. All right. I got 10 more minutes with you. 10 more minutes. We're going to talk about baptism. So if communion is an ongoing celebration, we're supposed to do communion again and again and again, which by the way, that's why we always offer communion down front every single week. About once a month, we take it all together, just like we did, either during worship or at the end of the message, or in this case, kind of in the middle. Uh, but every week, communion's available down front if you want to make it part of your worship. 
part of your worship, to celebrate and remember Jesus. But communion is an ongoing celebration. If you're taking notes, write this down about baptism. Let me start with this. Baptism is really meant to be a one-time celebration. Water baptism is meant to be an initiation into the family of God. Baptism is to celebrate and mark a moment that you are a new person and that you are part of a new family. In baptism, you are declaring, you are saying that you are a child of God and you are now a part of the big family of God, his church. The mandate to be baptized comes from Jesus. We looked at it last week in Matthew 28. Let's look at it again. This is known as the Great Commission. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make what? Disciples. In other words, go and help other people follow. Go and help other people become apprentices, followers of Jesus. And do that for all nations, meaning everybody's now invited into this life with God through Christ. It's an open invitation. And then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the what? Commands, all the ways. That's what we're doing this year. We're, we're going, let's go through all the commands, the ways of Jesus. He goes, teach them to obey all the things that I've given to you. Did you know baptism was so important that Jesus himself was baptized? It's not in your outline, but you can read it on your own if you want. Matthew chapter 3 is where it records Jesus' baptism. And now Jesus was baptized for a different reason than we are. Jesus wasn't baptized to represent his repentance and turn from sin. When we're baptized, that's what we're doing. We're basically saying it, it models that we would go under the water representing like our old life. And our old life is crucified with Christ. We are dead in Christ, right? And then we come up out of the water and it represents our new life that just as Christ was resurrected, we are now resurrected to new life in him. And so Jesus was the perfect sinless lamb of God. Right? It takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus' baptism wasn't a baptism of repentance, but it was a baptism of significance. It was a baptism that marked a transition, a change moment in his life, where Jesus was leaving the life of a carpenter behind, and he was stepping into this ministry moment for his life, three years, that would culminate in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and then ascension into heaven. And so for Jesus, his baptism was to mark a moment. So it was significant to Jesus, and Jesus says baptism should be significant to us. So before we celebrate a few baptisms through this last song, let me just give you two things the celebration of baptism invites me to do. Okay, real quick. Here's the first one. The celebration of baptism invites me, first of all, to unite with Christ. To unite with Christ. Baptism does not save you repentance and belief save you. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago, right? Like repent and believe. In that moment, we are changed. We are forgiven. We become a child of God. Baptism doesn't save you, but I think it does show you are saved. It is a picture of what has happened. Baptism is important. It's going public in our faith that we are now united with Christ. Look at how Romans chapter 6 says this. It says, or have you forgotten? He's writing to people saying, hey, these are people, you've come to faith in Jesus. You've been made new. You were already baptized. And he's reminding them. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his what? Death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, this is the good news of the gospel. We have also been raised to new, or we have also been raised to what? Life, just as he was. You see, through baptism, we are made partners in the life and in the work of Jesus Christ. And when I say we've been made partners, I don't mean that we actually bring anything to the table <laughs> other than the life ourselves. What I mean is that we are brought along into the life and the work of God through Christ, and then be invited into it. In other words, he, he's done all the work, and we get all the benefit. Think of it like this. When my kids were little, uh, we had Disneyland passes for several years, probably three or four years. We'd go up to Disney on the day off, 
and just, you know, fun memories as a family, but it was when they were all pretty little. So you can imagine, you know, those little people with little legs after a few hours of walking around the park and waiting in lines, they didn't want to walk in the park anymore. And so we had one of those double wide strollers because we had three kids, but that meant two got to be in the stroller, one still didn't. And so inevitably they would always take turns and go, dad, let us ride on your shoulders. And I would say, no, absolutely not. No, I, I didn't do that, right? I was sometimes a good father. And so I would say, yes, and I'd pick them up, and here we go, one, two, three, jump. And they'd jump, and I'd put them on my shoulders. And in that moment, they had the best view in Disneyland, right? Because we'd walk around, and if you're a little person and you're walking in crowds, all you're seeing is lumpy butts. That's all you're seeing, right? You're about this level right here. But you get up on this level, you have a different perspective. You have the best view in the park. And they get all the benefit, and I did all the work. This is how it is in our life with Christ. In baptism, here's what is happening. We are getting lifted up out of our sin, placed on Jesus' shoulders, and we get his resurrected life. We are a child of God who is part of the family of God. And so here's what I want to do. If you're getting baptized, a lot of you, you already pre-registered, you know you're getting baptized. I want to dismiss you right now. If you know you're being baptized or you're volunteering in baptism, or if you're here and you go, you know what, I, I didn't plan on doing it, but I want to. We have shirts and shorts and towels and changing rooms and everything you need that if you're going, that's a decision I want to make, man, I want to invite you into it. And I promise the water's warm. Okay, so if you're getting baptized or volunteering, just go ahead. I'm going to dismiss you right now. You can go ahead and stand up, move out. Let's let's celebrate those that are doing that today. Way to go. I know we have a handful of people that are ready to do this. That's awesome. We're proud of you and excited. Can't wait to celebrate you. As they're getting ready out there, uh, let me give you this last point, okay? Because through baptism... We are united with Christ. We are part of his big family, and that leads to this last one. Through baptism, it also invites me to unify with all believers. Write that down. Baptism unifies me with all believers. When you graduate from a school, you are now considered a what? Alumni. Some of you are like, I don't know, I never graduated. What is that called? Um, When you graduate from a school, you're now considered an alumni. Once a Marine, always a Marine. If you've ever served in any of our armed forces, even when your service is done, you are forever considered a what? Veteran, right? The reason for that is you are now part of a bigger story. You're part of something bigger. You're part of something greater than yourself. You're part of a bigger family. This is what baptism does. Baptism unifies us with all Jesus followers throughout all history who have ever been baptized before us. Isn't that amazing? We are part of this bigger, better story called the family of God. This is what's talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. Look what it says. Consequently, in other words, because you are now part of Christ, of God's family through Christ, you are no longer foreigners or strangers. You're not outsiders, but you are actually actually fellow what? What is the next word? Citizens with God's people and also members of his what? Household. You're in the family built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Pause right there. Isn't this incredible that through our baptism, you are linked to every Jesus follower who's ever been baptized before, going all the way back to the very first disciples of Jesus. You're part of that chain of the big family of God. And with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become the holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become the dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. It's talking about how now we are all part of this big family of God. And when all of us come together like we are in this moment... We are this living temple. This building is not what is sacred. You and I are what's sacred. And you and I, who have the Spirit of God living in us, are now the temple of God telling his story. Now, here's what I know about baptism. 
different groups and denominations and, and parts of the Christian faith have different ways that they baptize. Uh, Catholics differ from Protestants. Presbyterians differ from Pentecostals. Is it, is it sprinkled? Is it immersion totally under the water? Is it when you're a child or infant? Or is it when you're an adult? And, and let me answer that just by first telling you what we practice and why. We practice baptism by immersion. That means all the way under the water and all the way up. And we encourage it to be when somebody is at least like a teenager age or an adult. So that way it is their decision. And the reason we do that is not because we're against any other kind of baptism. It's simply because that's what we see when we look at Scripture. That people of their own choosing chose to believe and follow Jesus. And then they were baptized. And it says they went down and they come up all the way out of the water. But here's what I want to say. Regardless of how you were baptized or when you were baptized, here's what I would say. Your baptism counts. It's meaningful, it's significant. And you weren't baptized as a Catholic or you weren't baptized as a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Pentecostal. If you have been baptized, you were baptized as a Christian, as a Jesus person. You see, when someone is baptized, they are, not, they are proclaiming something bigger and greater than just what you see or what you know about them. When somebody is baptized, they are saying they are not just an American person or a Republican person or a Democrat person or a Catholic person or a Protestant person. No, when someone is baptized, here's what they're saying. I am a Christ person. When we're baptized, what we're saying is our primary identity, what is first and foremost in our life, is that we are a Jesus person who is part of this huge family that will one day all be reunited together for all eternity. And can you imagine what a party that will be? Woo, better than the one you thought of earlier. I'm going to invite the band to come back out. They're going to lead us in one last song that uh, on the screen, we're going to be able to celebrate all those that are being baptized. Let me just answer one last question as we're getting ready for this last song. Uh, probably the most often question I get about baptism is, you know, can, can somebody be baptized again? Like if I was baptized as a child, is it okay if I'm baptized again? Or if I was baptized as a teenager and now it's, you know, 30 years later and, and I've had this big change in my life and my play, you know, is it okay to be baptized? Let me answer that um, a couple ways. Yes, I would say, first of all, yes. It's between you and the Lord, okay? Um, I know many people that were baptized as a child and their parents did that for them. And if your parents did that for you, what a beautiful gift. That their heart and desire for you was that you would be a person of faith in the faith. That's what, those, that's what that baptism was. And what a beautiful thing. And if you are at a place now as an adult where you would say, you know what, I affirm what they did for me. And I want to confirm that, you know what, I am all in for Jesus and I want to be baptized of my choice and my decision and let that be significant in my journey of faith. And if that's you, I would say, by all means, that's between you and the Lord. Go for it. Um, or maybe um, you would say, you know what, I was baptized, but I think I want to do it again. I have actually been baptized twice. The first time was when I was 15 years old. And it was meaningful and it was significant. It was me as a teenager going, I'm all in for Jesus and I'm letting everybody know. And it was a meaningful, significant part of my faith journey and my faith story. And the second time I was baptized was like 24 years later, 25 years later in 2013, uh, when we went on a trip to Israel with a group of people in the church. Here's a picture of the second time I was baptized. And it was in the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. Some of you are like, is that a nuclear waste site? Um, <laughs> No, the barrels are there because we just rafted. We had like uh, canoed down the J Jordan River. And then you had to get out there because if you went farther, you could die. Um, so they were like, you know, safety barrels. And then you can see it was significant for me to be baptized. Not just because sun's out, gun's out for Pastor Mike, as you see there. Um, <laughs> nice tan, dude. Um, but uh, the reason it was significant, it was I was, a, I was a different person when I was like, you know, almost 40 years old than I was when I was 15 years old. And so to do that, yes, where Jesus was baptized, yes, to have my pastor and mentor, Pastor Mike, baptize me, all that was significant. But it was about me in that moment in my faith with Christ. Okay, you can go ahead and take those pictures down. Um, I don't want anybody getting jealous of Pastor Mike's arms. Um, 
So here's what I would say. If that's, if that's you, that's between you and the Lord, right? But you know what's awesome? No matter when you were baptized, no matter how you were baptized, you were baptized as a Jesus person, right? That, that we died with Christ and we are raised to new life in him. Man, that's what we're celebrating. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us and then uh, we're going to start, we're going to sing about the new life in Christ. And then right here on the screen, you're going to be able to see the people that are right behind you. Uh, or if you're at home or outside uh, that are being baptized today. And so uh, let's celebrate not just what they are celebrating in their new life, but why don't we all today affirm and reconfirm our faith to say, Jesus, thank you that we are made alive in you is what this song says. God, we worship you. We thank you for the new life that is in Jesus. And we celebrate with our friends that are being baptized today. They are united with Christ and they are unified with all believers throughout history. What a beautiful picture and gift that is. We worship you now in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's sing.